Welcome to Ernest and Hadley Booksellers in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Tonight we are launching Once Upon a Time in the 21st Century, Unexpected Exercises in Creative Writing by Robin Bain. Robin is professor of English and teaches in the MFA program in creative writing at the University of Alabama. She is the author of five volumes of poems, Quarry Cross, The Yellow House, Horizon Note, The Red Hour, and Paper Bird, and two chapbooks. She is co-editor of The Practice of Poetry, Writing Exercises from Poets Who Teach. Once Upon a Time in the 21st Century is a unique creative writing text that will appeal to a wide range of readers and writers from grade nine through college and beyond. Successful creative writers from numerous genres constructed these exercises, including poetry, fiction, and creative nonfiction to one act plays, song lyrics, genre fiction, travel guides, comics, and beyond. The exercises use a broad range of creative approaches, aesthetics, and voices, all with an emphasis on demystifying the writing process and having fun. Editor Robin Bain has divided the book into three writing exercises. Genres and forms, sources and methods, and style and subject. In each section, Bain offers a brief introduction which explains how to get started and specific ways to develop one's writing. Each introduction is followed by extensive exercises that draw on literature from classic to contemporary, as well as other art forms and popular culture. Welcome, Robin. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Eastie. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, we're really honored to have this invitation to debut our book here at um, Ernst and Hadley. It's just thrilling. And um, to my great surprise, we have some folks from UA Press here. So I'm going to invite you to introduce yourselves very soon. First, I wanted to introduce um, on my Hollywood Squares, she's right below me, Jenny Gropp, um, who is co-director of Woodland Pattern Books in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And before that was the managing editor of the Georgia Review in Athens. And even before that, the editor of the Black Warrior Review here at UA. And uh, before that, well, during that, a uh, master of fine arts student in creative writing at, uh, going back in your history. Uh, she's also the author of an extraordinary book of poetry from Core Press called The Robin and Egg, which I really recommend to you all. She's an extraordinary poet. And um, without Jenny, this book wouldn't exist. So I just want to talk a little bit about how this book came to be very briefly. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of making it into a book manuscript. And then I'm going to ask Jenny and um, Zana and Claire, we'd love to hear from you too, about how it then became a book book. <laughs> Um, so about a dozen years ago, I started a thing at the University of Alabama called the Creative Writing Club. And it was an after school activity for high school age writers all over the Tuscaloosa area. And the way we did it was I taught a graduate class for our current MFA students in creative writing. And in this class, we invented things for young writers to do and thought about what would be interesting, what would work. And then on the other day of the week, in an after school time, kids came from all over Tuscaloosa and my graduate students taught various creative writing experiences and lessons to them. And when we first started doing it, I thought surely there's a book of exercises or something we could draw from, but I didn't really find anything I liked that well. So we just decided to, decided to start making up our own exercises from uh, born out of the particular interests that those MFA students had in any given year. So all the exercises here really come from some writer's passion and interest and are born from that. Um, over the years, I asked my graduate students to write up their very best exercises, um, sort of with a book in mind. And we decided to do it in a first person way so the writer's always talking right to you. And that the audience they'd be addressing was young writers largely writ. I think it would work from junior high through adult. Um, but to have a very kind of informal and friendly way of addressing um, young writers, the writers who were gonna use the book. And then we had finally a great many of these exercises with a huge variety among them. Um, having gotten to that with the help of uh, George Thompson, who is UA's publisher in residence, who comes from time to time, who was a great advocate for our book. Um, the UA Press um, kindly decided to publish this book and we can't thank you all enough. 
Um, and all the time when we were editing it and putting it together, we had in mind that the exercises would be on the fun side, that though they would draw from a great bunch of different literary traditions um, and impulses in writing, and in that way be very intellectually uh, serious, at the same time, we'd make sure it was really fun every single minute. So the tone in the book, whoever's speaking to you from whichever exercise has that emphasis on fun. It would be a great book to give to anybody you know, young people, adults. Um, the whole idea is for it to be um, just having gobs of fun, low threshold to entering into it, lots of fun. All the exercises in the book can be done by one writer writing alone, and most of them can also be done in groups, whether it's pairs, threesomes, a classroom, a group, an after-school program, whoever it is, your family. So most of them can be flipped either way. We think that's really fun, especially during COVID. Um, uh, let me just say a word for Jenny. Jenny, long ago, was my research assistant in the department when she was a grad student. And um, we started talking about these exercises and what we could do with them. And Jenny and I decided that we would meet every single Friday afternoon, no matter what. And was it four o'clock or some late, late in the afternoon time? I don't remember, Jenny, do you remember? Yeah, remember? about, yes. Late on the afternoon. And we would just do something to move the book project along. At that time, we didn't know how it would be a book, who might want to publish it, anything like that. But every single afternoon. So I, we just want to recommend that as a way to get a large project done when you can't really even see what it's going to become. So, uh, and then Jenny stayed with me for a long time, helping with every aspect of this project. So hats off to Jenny. I would never, ever, ever have done this without her. Uh, enormous help. Finally, we did sort of edit all the exercises, so they kind of go together a little bit. They're in different voices, but they, they kind of have a unity to them. Um, let me stop there and turn this over to Jenny, but also Claire and Dan about like then what happened, because it was a long process uh, at the press. So uh, I think folks who haven't done a book of this kind that's an anthology might be interested to know kind of after that what happened next. So I'll turn it over to you all. Well, I think first, um, thanks, Robin, for that very generous introduction and um, just for going through everything for us. Um, it was wonderful. And although it was a long process, it did feel easy and organic to put together this anthology because as a teacher, you just would feel this is the time we have. This is how we can work with people. As we began to write chapters as graduate students, we realized how well they could work in the classroom immediately. Like those things were in tandem. And I think that's what makes this book remarkable is it is in practice already. Um, and so, you know, over a decade of working on this, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really crazy to think about. We did work on it constantly, and as we organized the the book into sections, it, it became it, it felt right to put it into the three that they are in. Um, you can explore forms. There's all kinds of creative adaptations. It, ex, it experiments with poetry, both like as an art, but also as a way to mess with things in the world, uh, which is very necessary now, I think, especially. Um, you know, so we went into the first round of edits with this thing. And, and then we went, it, we, it took, my goodness, I think the permissions after we put it into sections took the longest, it was years. Claire, um, would you like to talk about yeah. the permissions a little bit? Yes, please, this is your impressive <laughs> moment. Oh, that's so traumatizing then, it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, what we were getting permissions for? There, well, there were, um, well, I guess one question is how many people have had a chance to look at the book to kind of get some context for a conversation about this? I saw a few people holding it up. All right, thank you, Beth Cheryl. So essentially the exercises contained a lot of uh, examples of poetry, you know, long, long, you know, full poems or excerpts from poems. And the whole business with copyright is that you can't reproduce work that's under copyright that somebody else has created for your own, you know, to, to exploit. And we were, although this, you know, although the book is not intentionally trying to exploit work, it's really hard to like inspire, inspire an exercise or to get people thinking about poetry without referring to other work. So the challenge was how to incorporate other people's poem and use it as a launching pad and as inspiration without having to pay an arm and a leg for some of the <laughs> excerpts, because essentially it can become expensive. 
And in the history of publishing, people will say that, you know, song lyrics can become very expensive to quote. Fortunately, while we were working on this book, the Poetry Foundation worked with the uh, Center for Social Media and the Washington College of Law to create the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for Poetry, which really helped guide our thinking about how to use poems. And in the process of developing the Codes of Best Practices, the people who put this together actually pulled a lot of poets working with the Poetry Foundation and you know, learned to no one's surprise, or at least not to my surprise, that poets want their work to be read and used and to circulate in the world. And they don't necessarily you know, understand that you are not going to get a $500 reprint fee for the use of your poem, especially if you are not you know, Alden, for example, or, or, or a big name poet. And so through the, through the use of, through the process of doing the survey, it kind of became rather clear that the code of best practices is to use poetry and circulate poetry. And since this book was intended for an educational exercise and was published by a nonprofit scholarly press for use in, you know, community engagement situations, we felt, felt pretty comfortable in thinking that we were not really re repurposing other people's work for the sake of profit. For the, so in the end, we were able to kind of lean on, we did a fair use analysis for each example of copyrighted work that was in, in the book that we didn't also have, you know, there were cases where we did in fact have to get permission for some of these poems. Uh, but we analyzed every single example of poetry that was in the book and kind of assessed what was needed. And Robin had some fantastic graduate students who kind of did the legwork on a lot of this over time. And eventually we got through the, uh, the, through the list. And it wasn't just poems, there's a lot of prose examples True. also, with literary yeah, prose, yeah. yeah. And you can tell at the end of an exercise when it was too expensive, we, we thought you could probably find it on the internet. We just, you might want to look up and we just name the thing. So if we couldn't quote from it, that's why. And if we made sure it's something you could just Google it and find. Um, but we really appreciate all the immense patience and hard work of the press to get this done. We also had to get permissions, of course, from the uh, former MFA students who wrote the exercises to print them. And most of them had been written by more than one MFA student. You'll see that they have two, three, four authors on one of the exercises. So we had to make sure everybody was like, going, yeah, it's okay. Just took a little while. Dan, did you want to add anything? You acquired the book, right? <laughs> uh, actually, Curtis Clark acquired oh, that's it. that's right. Um, so yeah. I kind of inherited the book from Curtis, who uh, was uh, retired as our director a few years ago. But Claire really summarized it nicely. Um, Robin uh, was really good when there were cases where we thought we were using prose or poetry extracts that exceeded fair use we did what Robin said and either directed the reader um, to go find it, or we simply cut back on the percentage of the original poem or story that was being, so we did modif modify some of the exercises um, to allow us to use a portion of that material. And a lot of the work, as Robin said, was also getting uh, permissions in hand from the many, many graduate students who put these exercises together. Um, my role, you know, Claire on our end, uh, really carried a large burden. Um, I also wanna give credit to um, David Neese, who is our one of our designers in-house at the press, who really designed all of these pages and gave the book its look and feel and did the cover. And, um, uh, I think he did a marvelous job. I think, um, you know, this is not a normal book. It's not a typical work of uh, literary criticism or even poetry per se, but it's designed, I think the pages are designed in a very accessible and um, inviting way. Uh, I wish David were here because he really deserves all the credit for having the book look the way it does and feel the way it does. Thanks, everybody. And I, I think, although it did take a lot longer than any of us expected, 
<laughs> to come to fruition. I think this is a book that's going to have a long shelf life. I think it's going to get used for a long time to come. Um, the range of source material in it is really deep and wide. And um, I think it's going to be around for a good while. Yeah, I think you can get a bit of an education of, you know, literary movements over 20th into the 21st century and all kinds of ways to approach language that come from those traditions um, as you kind of work your way through the book without it being like a textbook to just teach you those things. So we really hope it has a long life. I think it will. Um, reading back over it, I still want to do all the exercises. We hope you will too. I think we could then segue into doing, we're going to do three quick exercises. They won't take too long. And uh, the first one is called Nice Hat Thanks. I'm going to share my screen. And it's so quick on the page, I think we'll just read through it. And then uh, Jenny and I are gonna demonstrate it. And after all that, you all are gonna try it. Here we go, it's word by word poems. And these are, um, it was put together by Kristen Ardsma, Brianne Lejeune and Brian Oleo. And Brian is still in Tuscaloosa, is one of our marvelous instructors. And we'll be doing a session on this uh, next Thursday with us. The poets Joshua Beckman and Matthew Rohrer created a new kind of collaboration. They wrote an entire collection of improvisational poetry called Nice Hat, Thanks, by going back and forth to create poems one word at a time. For example, if you and I were playing this game, it might go something like this. We'd agree on a subject on which to base our creation. Let's try antique teapots. And we would start off with a title. Jenny, would you do this with me? Our Boiled Mugs Shoes grandmother's hot heart and that's how it works and um let me stop sharing my screen uh, the fun thing is if while you do it one of you writes it down but maybe i'll invite dan to write this down while we do this if you want so um we're gonna go word by word every other one of us and if we want one of us can say end of title for our turn or we could say a punctuation mark for our turn you want to start us out jenny Oh, with the title? Yes. Oh, sure. How about cheese bits? Velvet. Who goes next? You. <laughs> Me? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Back and forth. Chunks. End of title. Remember. Your turn. Remember. How? Flowing. Cheesily. Yarn. Looks. On. Lapels. <laughs> Seems good enough. Then you can just say end of poem if you think end you of can. poem. But yeah. we could have kept going. See how that goes? So we're going to put you in breakout rooms where there'll be two people in each room. And you just give this a try. And there'll be some pauses, that's okay. Someone start, someone add a word, someone add a word, and you can either add end of title, punctuation mark, or end of poem. But just you know, carry on, the sillier the better. Ready? Okay, Easty, if you could put us into rooms such that we end up with two people in each room, and somebody write it down as you go so you can have a record on it. You're gonna get invited to a room and just, I'll share ours if that's okay with you, Chance, since I'm the one that wrote it down. So yeah, I'll lead off. Uh, the title of Chance and I did this. Our title is uh, The Landfill Haunts the Children. Here's the poem. Uh, Every night when I smell summer cactuses across the sand, I quiver loudly alone because I owe someone garbage. <laughs> even if they're forgiving, sorry, even if they're forgiving, immense guilt overcomes me. Sleek regret haunts me until voices shake my soul. That's ours. Let's <laughs> hear another one. Whoever read it down can read it off. I think Claire and I would share ours. It is shorter, but okay. we were very amused. The title is Albergine Cream Marine Dolphins. <laughs> Branch toward vile sunset, shimmering, arcing with dazzlement and prey. <laughs> End poem. Somebody else? 
keep it forever. It's okay. Um, Jenny, take us away into the next exercise, if you would, please. Sure. Okay. So this is going to be a little differently worked because we were going to use the chap. We're doing an Abecedarian, which is a poem that uses the letters of the alphabet. And we have a very collective exercise that we'll share from the book. But first, I wanted to offer you this simple poem, which shows a basic Abecedarian. Um, this is by Torin A. Greathouse. And what you can see in this poem, Abecedarian requiring further examination before a diagnosis can be determined, is that each letter at the beginning of the line is a, the first letter of the alphabet. Like, so it's A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, so antonym for me, a medical book, replace all the punctuation, commas, periods, semicolons with question marks and so on. But that is the basic form. So what we did in the book um, or what Sally Rogers rather did with her exercise is she switched it so I will switch my screen to her exercise now. Here we go. The collaborative Abecedarian for up to 26 writers. So as many people <laughs> And letters of the alphabet, which I love. Um, and it really gets people excited. Uh, kids, adults, they love this. I've done it with people at Woodland Pattern. All the kids at, um, in the CWC loved it too. Um, so she goes down and let's see here. Two examples of this written recently are a little more complicated. Um, and they take the form and they and they make it more extensive. So this one comes from Alphabet, which is a book length poem by Inger Christensen, who I love. Um, and there's Jingle Jangle by Harriet Mullen from her Alphabet organized books, Leaving with Dictionary, as Sally writes. Um, and the first five chapters of Christensen go like this. So one, apricot trees exist, apricot trees exist. Two, bracken exists and blackberries and blackberries. Bromine exists and hydrogen and hydrogen. Cicadas exist, chicory, chromium, citrus trees, cicadas exist, cicadas, cedars, cypresses, the cerebellum. So you see, she just continues to use these letters throughout the chapters. And she's doing this through the Fibonacci se sequence. So it's based on math. It's fascinating as it goes along. But in each one of the sequences, she includes all of the mathematical, the mathematical um, formula and then keeps the letter as the tonic as we go through it. Um, and in Harriet Mullins, we have the L and the M sections. These are really kind of hard to read out loud. So pardon me as I trip over myself. They're really fun though. Laffy Taffy, lame brain, large and in charge, late, great, later, gator, lazy, daisy, lean, cuisine, lean and mean, mean, machine, legal, eagle, lego, my ego, licking, chicken, licking, stick, little, kittle, liquors, quicker, lit, crit, liver, quiver, lizards, gizzard, local, yokel, long, dong, looney tunes, loopy, doopy, loose screws, loosey, goosey, lovey, dovey, low blow, <laughs> luck, duck, lump, some, lump, bunch, lust in the dust, Leonard Skinner. So there you get, that's L, feel the L pouring out of you. Um, and the same thing happens in the M. But the point is, is that you take your letter, you seize it, you run with it. It becomes the first letter of every word that you're using when you're writing. But not um, every word, right? Just lots of the words. Yeah, just lots of them. Yeah, lots yeah. of words. Yeah. Your favorite, you don't have to use it for every word. No, not every word. Yeah. But just it becomes the, the tonic, like I was saying. Um, anyway, so what we want to do is get to writing. Um, so here's here's her exercise. Now that we've read the examples, first you would write. If you're going to use this in a group, you'd write this on um, the alphabet on a series of 26 note cards. We don't have that many people, so we'll break into small groups. And what we can do is let each person in the group pick a letter, and you pick a method. 
and you will work with that as you go. Um, so when you get into your small group, pick a letter, assign it, and then you, you're gonna work with that letter for about seven minutes. Um, and then we will come back and smash them together and we'll see what we have. Um, and we'll put it in the chat so we know which letter everybody's working with, although it will probably be obvious. Um, Question. Yes, please. What do you mean work with it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so working with it in the sense that either you could do something really simple, like I think if you take the letter and you make it be the first, like the beginning of each word, but not each word, but you focus on it. So um, moves like minutes might feel maybe that's M, right? Um, so you're, you're going to be able to connect that letter and, and make it the highlight of your piece. Is this another thing you might right? decide is like these examples we've just looked at, mostly yeah. the writer is naming items. Just like this yeah. exists, name a thing, name a thing, name a thing, without worrying about making a sentence or anything like that. Uh, it could just be a we, list of items, a list of things, a list of words. It doesn't have to be like a story or make sense like a sentence. Just stuff. But we're doing yeah. this out, out loud. We're not actually writing at this point. Is that? We're about to write. You're about to write. So you spend like seven seven minutes doing it. So if you like, I think that this, this highlighting this that Sally says is oh, really okay. good. Um, <laughs> you know, take a few minutes per note card, which means just you with your letter, right? Um, aim for a variety of links and techniques. Um, and then you can copy Inger's style, Inger Christensen's style. So naming what exists in the world. Other letters you might borrow from Mullen, a concentration on sound, rhyme, pop culture, compound words and phrases. It's really, really open-ended is the point. So you should feel free. Just feel, feel the letter as you would feel it. You are not trying to do what anyone else is doing. It is very open to you. And I don't think we're in small groups yet. I think we're each doing this individually. Is that correct, Jenny? Sure, we can do it like that yeah. if, if you'd rather. Yeah. And then we'll go into small groups to share it if we choose. To share. To share. OK. Does that sound good? Okay. So great. You could, okay. I think we can all just um, maybe stop our video if we wish and just sort of pick a letter and go for it for a few minutes. Make sense? Just whatever comes to mind when you're leaning into the letter. Got it? Mm -hmm. One okay. letter per person? Yes. You choose your own favorite letter, whatever it is. You pick your letter and go for it for a few minutes. I'll read. Um, Thanks. My letter was M. And here goes. Mars may move closer to my moon, more miles missed. Maybe mouths make money, moolah, malarkey, mashups mixed, mind moored to mind miracles made, mauled, maxed credit card mania, marred my <laughs> movie, miss, missed the mark, muck, mucked the maybes, missiles marred the marble. That's all. Awesome. Right. Thank you. That's fun. <laughs> A lot of the exercises in this book are just about love and language. You know, there's two hours. Mm, that's fun. That's great. Somebody else, Beth, would you like to read yours? Sure. Thanks. Let's see. Oh, I guess I'm unmuted. Okay, I had P. Uh, punctual pink potatoes paired in the pot punctuate the privilege of pronouncing pump pumpkin pie. Pods of purple plums with plumes play pranks. People play some perfectly. Pink panthers and pecans politely pass the peas. <laughs> please, pretty please parse this poem, then post. Awesome. Thank you so much. It has such a different mood and tone than the M one, you know? It's really interesting. <laughs> That's so fun. Uh, Ashton, did you do one? Okay. And uh, I'm working on uh, emails and check. photos and everything, yep. I want to hear someone who's got F. <laughs> Easy, did you one? Or T. Did you have one Easy, a letter? No, I'm sorry. I don't. Okay. I've got a letter. I picked E. I wonder why. 
I had E on mine, so I did E. Easty at Ernst and Hadley, easing our minds. It's easy, it's easty, evermore, even when evening song. Even in the event of frolic, everyone, every day, earlier and earlier, in the event, eek, in the event of an event, nowhere, Erewhon, eating the words, everyone then, certain entertainments, especially. Excellent. I want a copy of that. <laughs> it's a pay on to earn some money. Anybody else? These are fun. It is um, fun. Yeah, the idea is a lot of the idea of the book is just to uh, have fun with language. You know, we so often have to use it for like sending an email or a text or writing a report or, you know, poor language gets beat up by those kind of things. So part of the goal of the whole book is just to like let language loose um, in all kinds of different ways. And some of them take a lot longer to do. These are some of the shorter ones. There's really fun to get 26 months. people to go around the room and do the whole alphabet, you know. Or some of would do it where. I'm sorry, these, please, please. I think these last two would be good, like warm up activities, yep. you know, just to get yourself kind of going. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of letting the words take you over instead of the other way around. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, time to take tea. Trouble teases the takeaway. Two, 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 always two. The turbulence tumbles this way. Therefore, time to take tea. Time to take away the turbulence. Time to trouble the trees. Tossing the tensile air this away. Ooh, fun. <laughs> forward so a challenge for myself b for vendetta valentine vengeful voraciousness veering into the voluminous expanse of very very v <laughs> how i'm suddenly forgetting vicious vixen voracious again vivo veni vidi vici quo vitis man varum <laughs> vohizi vodun odin varum voodoo and hoodoo variously <laughs> vagrant vacant vacancy is my mind today v for various volumes of bearing bearing for foray foray hurabura the mom wraths out grave <laughs> variety is trade magazine variety is the spice of life various is a handy word it does a basket full of work very daring very daring very very quite contrary how many words might fit in my ever voracious mouth <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Let's go on to our third and final exercise. And after that, we'll do some questions if anybody has one or comments or, or whatever. Um, and for this one, uh, some of the exercises in the book, as you've just heard, are about language play, uh, putting words together in ways you might not otherwise, really for the sake of just loosening up language and enjoying it. Other exercises in the book are um, have to do with literary styles, literary forms, and then a few of them have to do with writing about certain things, actually suggesting subjects that you might write about. Uh, that's not the bulk of the book, but there's there's a kind of chunk of those in there. So this next one is that type. And I also thought I'd read it to you, it's not very long, as an example of the kind of tone that we use in the book. This particular exercise, but I'm going to try to share it, hopefully it'll work. Yes. Oh, wrong one. Here's the one. Can everybody see Pets of the Roman Empire? Is that somebody tell me yes or no? Yes, okay. Let me arrange my screen a little better here so I can see it. Okay, these are some pages from the book. Um, let me make it a little bigger. No, oh, can't make it smaller. Okay, Pets of the Roman Empire, Dinosaurs of Today, Avoiding the Cute Kitty Cat When Writing About Animals. One of the things that we um, did try to do in the club was uh, kind of lead folks away from writing in expected or cliche kinds of ways. Cliches aren't just phrases like it's raining cats and dogs. Cliches are also cliches of thought, associations we usually have, ways we usually write. So a lot of these are designed to sort of just try something another way. Okay, here it comes. So I'll just read this. Avoiding the cute kitty cat when writing about animals. And it's by Kirk Pinho. I envision a major world event that was caused by a pet. Um, and here's Kirk talking to you. These are all in the whole book written in first person like this. I've been debating getting a dog since I moved away from home, but I always find some reason not to do it. I don't have enough money to feed it. My home is too small. I don't have enough time. It would poop all over my yard, etc. Even as someone who loves dogs, I've never been able to get one of my own because I would have to become financially invested in it, or I would have to alter my schedule entirely just so it could sully my lawn. 
the human-pet relationship is complicated. Here you will explore ways to maintain the emotional integrity of a person-pet relationship while also distancing yourself from the typical perceptions of dogs, cats, birds, fish, lizards, cows, guinea pigs, squirrels, frogs, tarantulas, yeti, etc. Poems about how cute your kitty cat is don't make the cut. And I'm going to scroll real fast and then I'm going to go back. You'll see there are three paragraphs here. And we're going to give you three choices of, oops, let me get this. We're going to give you three choices of what to write next. So I'll read out these three things. And as you hear them, pick one. And if you don't know what to pick, just point and shoot, you know, pick arbitrarily, that always works. And then we're just going to give you a little bit of time to just, you know, write according to whichever of these three animal writing prompts you picked. And, you know, first thought, best thought. That was always our motto with the Creative Writing Club. Whatever comes to mind, perfect, put it down, okay? So I'll read three and you'll be deciding which one you want to do and then we'll give you a chance. Here we go. All right. Pets in history. This is choice number one. What would happen if your cat mittens was actually the catalyst for a third world war? What if Buckles, the dog, actually shot Lincoln? What if the fall of the Roman Empire to the barbarians of Gaul was really sparked by a disagreement over who got to ride your pony? The goal of this exercise is to get you thinking about pets in history and envision a major world event that was caused in some way, shape, or form by a domesticated animal. This is designed to be fun, so go nuts, but beware the event the animal caused has to have been world changing and the animal that sparked the event has to be one that is commonly relatively commonly kept as a pet. Dogs, cats, fish, birds, snakes, most kinds of lizards and farm animals are all fair game, no pun intended. So far so good. So you kind of picture if you chose that one, what, what you might do. So whatever world event comes to mind, grab the first one, pick your pet. Okay, here comes the second choice, ready? Dinosaurs today. People in the modern age have long studied dinosaurs, a, fascina sorry, a fascination of humankind for years. Your goal for this exercise is to write a poem about a pet dinosaur, whatever kind of dinosaur that might be. Dinosaurs were formidable or even terrifying lizards. In fact, in Latin, that's actually what dinosaur means. The object of this writing is to give the dinosaur a personality, whether it's scary like a Tyrannosaurus, a bit more affable, like a brontosaurus or a triceratops, name it. Mentally interview it and ask it strange questions. What wacky, bizarre, unique things does it do? Where does it sleep? What do your neighbors think about having Stanley the Stegosaurus nearby? So you're gonna have, in whatever way you want to have, if you choose this one, a pet dinosaur. And you can write about it, something it does, some situation, whatever you want. You can imagine it however you want. And you don't have to know a lot about dinosaurs, just whatever you think. Here's the last choice. I know it's hard to pick. Your pet describes you. So this is an exercise in point of view. Pets see us at our best and worst, just as we do with them, never saying a word. Here's your chance not only to assume the personality of your pet or a fictional pet, but also to examine yourself, whether it be at your kindest, your meanest, happiest or your saddest, the I in this poem or story, if you choose to use I, is not you, the poet or fiction writer or some other human character. The I is your pet or fictional pet speaking. Consider the following things. How would the animal speak if it granted a voice? Would it have a lisp? Maybe it would have a very aristocratic tone. I'm thinking of a cat here. What sparks this particular reflection? Uh, is it a moment of anger towards the human? A moment of tenderness? What makes this snapshot in time particularly interesting for the pet? Consider that what is interesting for the pet also has to be interesting for your audience. So that's your pet describing you. And for those of you who have the book in hand, we're on page 286 and 287. So just to review, the choices are your pet in history, your dinosaur today, your pet dinosaur, or your pet talking about you in whatever way you want to construe that. So pick whichever one comes to mind. First thought, best thought, that's one of our mottos. And we'll give you about five minutes to go for it, whatever it might be, okay?
about five minutes. Enjoy your meal. Welcome to those who are just now able to join us. If you have a copy of the book, we're doing the exercise on page 296 and 297. I see Shamir here and I see Laurel. Um, if you don't have a copy of it, uh, let me know and we'll, we'll, maybe we'll just project again what the directions are. Does that sound good? So I'm gonna put these up on the screen. So we're just picking one of these three and writing them out. So I'll just scroll through this in case the folks who just joined us don't happen to have the book in hand. So here's the first choice, that's in history. And I'm scrolling to our second choice, Dinosaurs Today. And the third and last choice is Your Pet Describes You. everybody. I'm glad you're back. Um, I'm looking at the clock here and I think we'll um, go now on to the question and answer part of our event and um, leave you with your pet animal to spend the evening later on and see what happens and who eats whom or whatever. Um, a lot of these are uh, exercises that encourage you to start something and then you can take it wherever you want after that. We always say go with the spirit of the exercise, whatever occurs to you, there's no one right way to do it. Um, I thought we'd open it up now to um, any comments anybody wants to make or things you'd like us to talk about, questions you'd like us to answer, myself or Jenny or Dan or Claire. Or, um, we're happy to talk about the book or anything to do with it. Personal thing, and that I, I said this to Dan that, um, this is a weird time machine for me, of course, you know, going back through all, <laughs> all everybody and all those classes. Um, and it, it, it was, it was an amazing uh, um, accretion over the years. I mean, that was a really, really, really good uh, generator. So not a Thanks. question, but more, uh, you know, just a comment. Yeah. Thanks. I have that feeling too, looking back over it. We did that creative writing club for a long time. Both of your kids were in it, right? Sam yeah, and Nick yeah, both. Yeah. I That's remember what I was right? Just thinking about, yeah, is <coughs> yeah. Sam and Nick, you yeah. know, just how wonderful they were uh, yeah. in there. Yeah, and they're still both writing. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> there <yeah>. you go. <laughs> Our yeah. philosophy was always just to make it really fun and not a contest ever. We did never have a competition of any kind in the class. Mm -hmm. No prizes given, just everybody write, have fun and share. And I think that kind of helped everyone feel really free. 
And we also enjoyed the Creative Writing Club in that it brought high school age students to the campus of UA. And many of them, though they lived in the area, had never been on the campus before. And it was also a way for kids from different high schools, home schools, parochial schools, yeah. whatever it was, to meet one another. Mm. And, you know, forms really nice friendships and camaraderies. And it's a great thing. We may do it again. It sort of morphed over into a couple of things. We now have a volunteer program for our MFA students, writers in the schools, where those who wish to will go out and get paired with a K through 12 teacher in the Tuscaloosa area and um, sort of embed themselves as a creative writing teacher in their class, which is really fun. Mm -hmm. I yeah, love this. Young oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Please go ahead, Shamir, by all means. I'm so sorry. I, I was just saying that I, I just absolutely love this this pet exercise. It's such a yes. such a neat thing to do. It really took me back to um, I never thought about writing from the perspective of my cat. And I just Great. came up with something really neat. It was fun. Thank you. Yeah. It's one of the most fun ones in the book, I think. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Another thing we're doing is a young writers camp, which is from um, it's junior high and high school age. Uh, rising junior high kids to graduating high school students this summer in June for two weeks. Um, and we'll use some of these exercises and other ones that our MFA students will invent. Where is it going to be? It's going to be virtual this year because okay. we just don't really know where we'll be with a pandemic. So I decided we'll just do it virtual. Yeah. Um, yeah. My son, Fly, who um, is now 16, did the oh. summer writing camp uh, two years in a row and loved it and, and was really unhappy that it got canceled last summer. Uh, that would have been his third year. So um, he's really loved that both times he's done it. Um, well, tell Eli it's happening again this summer. Okay. No yeah, worries. I canceled it last summer just because everything was suddenly thrown. We had it all advertised as an in-person thing and I, we just, yeah, we couldn't get it organized in time, but it'll be virtual this summer, but it'll be two weeks in June, morning and afternoon, just and like before. Made some good friends through that too. Great. Yeah, the friendships that we saw as teachers built through that camp, it's, it's incredible. They're lifelong, a lot of them. Um, the students also stay in touch with the teachers. So I've watched some of these kids grow up. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful. Any other questions for Robin or Jenny? I, I really enjoyed the exercise. Sorry to get on so late. I do see you're recording it. Is it possible to watch the recording to hear the other exercises that I missed? Sure, we'll, we'll uh, get it up and then uh, I guess we'll just put it on our website somewhere, Ashton. Ashton is responsible for the website too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do anything. Awesome. He, he does it all. <laughs> so um, we'll make sure it gets put up on the website. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you for doing this. Sure. Cool. Thank you for joining. I know everybody's zoomed out and doing 10 things at once. So thank you so much for dropping by. Well, just remember sure. that Robin has all, most of her books here, not all of them, but most of her books are in the store and as well as Martone. <laughs> Um, and so, and, and, and Teresa, and so um, feel free to come over and visit us. And in the meantime, keep reading the book. I'm sure you'll discover other beauties in it and um, all that is good with Robin. So thank, thank you, you all for coming tonight. And a, a, we had a, a, a wide variety of play, people and I'm so happy to meet you, Jenny from Milwaukee and, uh, and wish you all the best up there. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank you so great. much for hosting us, Easty and Company. We truly appreciate it. We love these reunions. I feel like the book is now launched, you know, sort of it's, it's off it's into the world, like a book birth. With you. We really right. appreciate it. And, you know, again, my abiding thanks to the press. I don't even have words, you know. So thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, have a Thank good you. evening. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.